I've been wanting to do this for a long time, part or something. You're looking at a boy with no remorse. It's murder. No morals. And I stabbed his neck. And vile intentions. I cut open his belly to see his guts. It really me. Just days ago, he brutally murdered and desiccated a homeless man in an attack so deplorable it could only be described as pure evil. This is him. I was straddled on top of him like this. Okay. And his head was halfway cut off. But instead of trying to trick the cops and hide his guilt, the killer was ready to tell police everything they needed to know and led them to a discovery that would petrify even the most experienced cops. Well, it could be the upper arm or a leg. Well, there's three. There, there, and there. This is the chilling case of Brian Cohey. The courtroom at the Mesa County Justice Center was packed for the trial of Cohey in January 2023. His victim, Warren Barnes, was a 69-year-old homeless man whose life was taken in the most brutal way imaginable by an evil, stone-cold 19-year-old killer who showed no remorse for his crime. Barnes was known as the Reading Man around Grand Junction and was described as a gentle and kind soul who would help anyone in need. He never begged and instead chose to work for an agency to make ends meet. All he asked for in return was his favorite spot to sit and read his books. But tragically, the peaceful life of Warren Barnes was shattered in February 2021 when he was murdered in an unprovoked attack. His killer, Brian Cohey, found him sleeping under a bridge where he stabbed him to death and for nothing more than curiosity to see what it would feel like to take a human life. But Cohey wasn't finished there and decided to cut up the body, even taking parts home as some kind of sick trophy. Oh, it's right here. Oh, you see it? Yeah. Because there's an arm. Oh, shit! <laughs> hey. There's another one. There's an arm, there's another arm. Put simply, this is one of the worst cases I've seen, but the depravity doesn't end here and gets even worse in the interrogation room, where police realize just what kind of monster they're really dealing with. It's murder. I mean, I'm going to jail for okay. 20, probably, but um, I drive a 2007 Ford 500, okay. and I keep a small, 18-inch bat in there for self-defense and a large kitchen knife in the glove box, both for self-defense because uh, I don't really trust anyone. Yeah, it was the night of February 27th. It was a full moon. And I figured I can see so well, why not drive out? Cohey was arrested on March 1st, 2021, after his mother found the severed head and hands of Warren Barnes in her son's closet, a horrifying discovery that was made inside the same home that was also used as a daycare center. His mother, terrified at what she saw, called police, and Cohey was charged on suspicion of first-degree murder, tampering with evidence, and tampering with a deceased body. I don't have to tell you how rare it is that a killer will reveal the full details of their crimes in the first interrogation, but Brian Cohey is a different breed of killer and he was ready to map it all out for the police in every bloody detail. And eventually driving underneath the bridge near the sheriff's office. You know like how Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, oh was... there's a road underneath, right? Uh-huh. Out under the overpass. And I was driving along and I see a shape here on the railway track. So I'm like, oh, interesting. Okay. And I'm like, that's a homeless person. So I grab my knife, I put on three layers of gloves. It sounds backwards, but it looks like this could be the start of Cohey's defense, as he would later plead not guilty by reason of insanity, an act that was likely an attempt to get a lighter sentence or spend his incarceration in the comparatively lush surroundings of a medical facility instead of a jail. But as Cohey continues, one detective wants to know more about the true state of his mental health. And Brian, before you start, you say you have a major depressive disorder? I'm just curious what those are. Actually, I have several. I have high functioning Asperger's. Okay. I have ADHD, uh -huh. a major depressive disorder. 
Although he was diagnosed with several conditions, he did see a doctor only days before the murder over an abscess under his arm. And that doctor was quoted as saying Kohi was, quote, definitely not psychotic at the time. It looks more like Kohi has been planning this for a very long time, and he thinks he knows how to outsmart the police here. But instead of making him look insane, this interrogation is going to make him look like a corrupt, cold-hearted, and calculated killer. I took the knife, I pulled back the canvas, and I stabbed his neck. Okay. He was panicking at first, in his old man's voice. He was in his 50s. I don't know why I, know why I call an old man. He was saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why? Why? And I just kept on stabbing his neck. I was... Is this okay if I do a demonstration? Oh, yeah. This is him. I was straddled on top of him like this. Okay. And uh, he couldn't fight back. During the time, I was growling and making the animal unsick noises. I was so excited, so rushed up on adrenaline, and I just got it. And um, I paused, and he's like, why are you doing this? And I, and I said, I've been wanting to do this for a long time, for or something. And then I continued. The whole ordeal lasted about a minute, minute and a half. Okay. And I stopped. And when I was finished stabbing him, he took out his last breath, a grunt, and his head was halfway cut off in stabs. No, actually, after I killed him, I just couldn't stop saying, stinky, dirty, dirty. And then, after that, I stripped his clothes, I cut open his belly, to see his guts. They're really pink. Sorry, that was morbid. Um, and uh, then I cut off his head. I gave him a Glasgow smile. What's that? A Joker smile. I, I destroyed his eyes by stabbing them. In. Okay. And then I cut off his hands. I put those in plastic Ziploc bags. And then I cut off his right arm at this joint okay. and at this joint. I left his body there. And then I took the head, put it in a leftover box when we took dinner a few nights ago. And then I took the hands, put them in the back, drove home, hid the hands and head in my room, cleaned the knife, threw away the garbage with, with the blood on it. And then I tried going to sleep, but I was worried that because there was a hole in my gloves right here, I was worried that they would be able to obtain a partial print. Mm -hmm. So I figured, why not go all the way? I drove back in a different outfit, picked up his body, surprisingly heavy, um, put it in my trunk, and drove to the Blue Heron drop-off station. Okay. I parked, so it's like this, right? So let's say this is ground. The ramp is quite steep. And you need to have four-wheel drive to uh, pull out of it. Okay. And uh, my car did it. And I open the trunk, I take his body out, I put it in the water, and because I don't want fingerprints on a body, so I just try moving it with my shoes. Um, that works successfully. He goes out some part in the river and floats off. Okay. God knows where he is now. Around high school, Kohi had earned the nickname Dahmer amongst his peers. It really doesn't get much worse than that. And there was a reason for the name, too. He had a morbid fascination with Jeffrey Dahmer. And the allure from his passion would soon become too tempting, causing the curiosity to become reality. In fact, it was quickly revealed in the investigation that he had been planning to kill someone for at least a year before the murder, and had already constructed a handy kit in preparation. Last year, my parents found a kit I had been assembling. It had hammers, shovels, knives, um, large zip ties, duct tape, okay. uh, saw. That was meant for hurting people. This gruesome kit contained all the tools needed, but things would not go quite according to plan. Then when I tried to inevitably try it out, yeah. my car didn't come out. From Blue Heron. Yeah, from Blue Heron. Yeah. My car was stuck. I tried putting it Full throttle. Yeah. That doesn't work. My car didn't have four wheel drive. <laughs> okay. Me. Okay. And so then I tried putting it in low gear. 
I'm trying everything at this point. Right, right. And it still doesn't come out. How do we call a tow for that? So it's I don't know, because he'd have to get in the friggin' water. Yeah. And then it slides into the river. Oh! My car slides into the river, me inside. Oh. If Kohi had been trying to avoid the police, then he was going about it all the wrong way, as he was about to come face to face with them and was on the verge of being caught in the act. And so I'm there in a car quickly being flooded with water in the river that's almost freezing. Yes. I'm drenched. <laughs> I almost died. So I'm able to climb out. Um, I don't see the body, so I'm, I assume this is travel a bit. Okay. I need to act fast or else I'll die of hypothermia. I'm, a, yeah. I'm panicking a bit at this point. I'm going to be like, this is what I'm going to be remembered for dying of hypothermia and a botched attempt at hiding a body. And I'm just like, Fuck. Right, so I'm running. So I go up the road and I'm trying to fly down the car. One doesn't come by for five minutes. Eventually it does. And it was an old high school friend. I don't know his last name. He's able to, those Fitz Samaritans. Right. Helped me call my parents to let them know my car is in the river. Okay. So I say that I drive down to the Blue Heron Point and just park and just they turn off the car and think. Okay. And uh, I tell them that I'm stupid and I park too low and that my car flies in the river. Okay. Did they believe it? Yes. Okay. So the police. The police came too? Yes, they called the police because. They tried, after, while they were warming up, they tried five different tow truck companies. All of them said, oh, we're drivers off shift, or, oh, we don't have the proper equipment. So they called the police. So one of them told them to call the state patrol. They couldn't get the number from the state patrol, so they called 911. During his 24 counseling sessions with Dr. Phillips, Cohey showed countless red flags. Apart from his fascination with Jeffrey Dahmer and other killers, he idolized dictators and madmen, often referred to trans people as its, and even questioned why it was wrong to steal or hurt someone. He even admitted to bullying a young girl just to try and trigger her PTSD. In the week leading up to the murder, he had become more talkative during his shifts at work, which was unusual behavior for him. And this could be down to the fact that he had been driving around for weeks weeks before the murder on the hunt for a victim. You said you've thought about doing this for the last six months a year. Yeah. Um, have you ever done it before? No. No. Okay. You gotta ask, right? Yeah. How about animals? Have you practiced on anything? Yes. It's pretty big stuff. Tell us about that. First of it was 2018 Halloween. A stray black cat had been coming around our house and, and I was thinking about killing him. I then hit the body in the shoebox, and then I disposed it in the trash and got away with it. Okay. And that cat. Did you keep him for a while like you did this guy, or...? I kept it for three days, then it started to stink. And when did you start thinking about killing people? Six months ago. Well, actually, I was thinking of killing people during the cat, but I wasn't acting on it. Um, but I started seriously thinking about killing people a year ago. How about when you were 12? Did you think about coming out? So what in your life has changed or what in your mind has changed? Makes you know. His morbidly patched together murder kit contained knives, a hammer, a shovel, and zip ties. When he first concocted his plan to see how it would feel to murder someone, he had different intentions altogether. But those plans had to change when his parents found his murder kit and gave Kohi a simple choice. So what was the plan back then? The plan was to go find because there's no prostitutes in Grand Junction, I would think. Have you ever had any sex crimes? Yeah. yeah. There's not prostitutes like five of them standing alongside the room, but there's prostitutes in Grand Junction. Yeah, the plan was to go with one of them and have them come with me. And then the plan was to subdue them and tie them up and then torture her. That would have been sexual in nature. This was just to see what it felt like. But that would have been sexual. So you've thought about the sexual killing, but this one was just see what killing comes. Yeah. Your mom found your stuff, right? Yes. And got rid of it. Why didn't you go back to that plan? Why change plan? Too, too much risky. Oh. First time in a row, 
They'll be like, okay, that's really suspicious, but okay, we forgive you, don't do it again. Okay. Second time in a row, we're calling the police on you. Oh. Um, I didn't want to do that again. Okay, fair and enough. Risk. And so they didn't call the police? Uh, no, because I told the, I, they gave me an ultimatum, have them throw it all away, or call the police. So I threw it all away because... You thought if you started rebuilding that plan, they'd find out? Yes. Okay. He had seen many doctors and therapists over the years, and back in 2020, he had complained of frequent headaches, which led to his doctor to perform a CT scan that came back as normal. Although he had reported feeling suicidal, his family doctor would later testify that was the one and only time that he knew where Kohi had expressed thoughts of killing himself. But from my perspective, it looks like Kohi desperately wants to appear insane, and he's doing it in a pretty smart way. All throughout the interrogation, he's dropped hint after hint, and he might just be crazy, even coming up with an unofficial diagnosis supposedly given to him by someone who wasn't even a doctor. I was tested at a um, other facility. The doctor's name was Kathleen. It's, they tested me for autism for a formal diagnosis, okay. Asperger's, mm -hmm. which is high-functioning autism. Yep. And they also said that I was schizo something. They said I, was, I had something that was schizo. And who said that? Ultimately, Kohi had chosen Barnes as his victim instead of a prostitute because he was homeless and thought he wouldn't be missed. But being such a popular man around town, it didn't take long for his absence to be noted and for someone to raise an alarm. But there still remains a question. If Kohi hadn't been caught, would he have killed again or have a desire to kill again? Chillingly, this question had a heavily implied answer as when he marked the location of Warren Barnes's murder on his phone, he used the reference first. At the trial, Kohi's defense would claim that a combination of his mental disorders made him snap in the moment and kill Barnes without fully realizing what he had done. But in the state of Colorado, to be found not legally sane at the time the crime was committed, a person must fail to distinguish between right and wrong. But he's already admitted to the crime, revealing the extensive details of what he'd done and how he'd planned to cover it up. That tells me, just like it told the jury, that he understands the consequences of his actions and therefore must be declared sane. 30 of Barnes's closest friends and family were in court when Kohi was found guilty in February of 2023 after two days of jury deliberation. They watched as he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, giving them the minute solace that his killer would never see freedom again. The death of Warren Barnes and the circumstances around it resonated throughout the Grand Junction community, which will take a long time to recover from one of the most horrific crimes Colorado has ever seen.